short question up front. How many of you know Mesos already? Oh, that's quite a number. How many of you have used Mesos before? S little smaller subset. Okay, uh, f for the rest of you, and I hope also for those guys who already know it, uh, I'll start with like a short introduction, what Mesos is about and what problem we're trying to solve. I hope that's still interesting for you. And then we're going to go on to like more advanced topics. Uh, maybe just as some advertisement directly after this slash after the lunch break, there's going to be another talk about service discovery and Mesos. So I also, uh, I'm, I personally am very much looking forward to that talk uh, already. So what is the problem we are trying to solve? So data centers, they have evolved quite a lot over the time. And uh, this also means that we need different software to run it because we are at a very different scale. And um, also the applications we are writing for in general, they are changing. Like first uh, couple years back, we wrote applications for mostly mainframe computers. Then we went over to like a more uh, client server architecture um, and then uh, came the movement uh, driven like by virtual machines where it can really like have a bunch of virtual machines which increased utilization and also enabled a uh, nicer decoupling of different services because I, I could just spin up virtual machines much much faster than I could do it uh, with a physical machine which I actually had to provision in a data center but right now we actually we're in a world uh, where we have applications which are not only running on a single virtual machine. So uh, we are actually having applications which run an across an entire data center. Like uh, I was just at the talk about Spark, so Spark, uh, Hadoop, uh, all those NoSQL databases, they are not written for a specific single server or single virtual machine instance, but they are actually architectured and designed to run across like a large number of uh, of nodes in a in a cluster, and here we actually we also need a kind of different operating system to manage those applications. So, for example, uh, how does it still look with many of our customers? They have those new applications. They have like Fling for data streaming. They have Cassandra. They have some Rails applications uh, as front end uh, user facing applications. Some Spark for uh, uh, analytics maybe some memcached. So, but what they're doing right now, they actually split up their cluster into physical junk. They're saying these machines, they don't necessarily are uh, physical machines. Those can also be virtual machines. But they basically, they assign a static part of their resources to a Flink cluster, a static part to their Cassandra cluster, and so on. And those uh, yields on a number of problems. So maybe the first problem most people are going to hit, what happens as soon as machines are failing? So for example, Rails, which is the user-facing uh, part of my uh, application ensemble, if I have some nodes failing there, maybe there's one switch or an entire rack failing, uh, I soon going to have to do something as an operator. So. In this world, what I would have to do is I have to physically switch over nodes from, for example, my memcached or Flink cluster, which are not that sensitive or user-facing, and move those machines over to the Rails part of my cluster, just in, a, uh, in order to have the same latency for users. Um, and this is something I, as an operator, I don't want to be paged at night just because some nodes failed. The second problem of the static partitioning is that I actually I waste a lot of resources. So uh, different applications have different usage profiles. So for example, my Hadoop job, it's mostly going to run overnight and process whatever happens throughout the day. Uh, my Spark streaming job uh, might have a different profile. My Flink cluster might have a different profile. And so what actually I end up at, I waste a lot of resources because I have to provision full virtual machines or uh, even full physical machines for each of those clusters. What we much rather would like to have is that we can all move it together, that we can share resources across those frameworks and achieve a much, much better utilization um, and uh, not waste that much resources. The second trend in uh, many data centers we're seeing today are containers. Uh, how many of you have know about Docker? 
Yeah, most people, that's what I guess. Uh, how many of you have used Docker in production services? Okay, that's already less. But yeah, that's also a trend we're seeing. And it actually, it really helps uh, us to solve this problem of moving stuff closer together. Because compared to virtual machines, uh, containers, they are much smaller and easier to spawn. Um, but the problem is uh, container management. I personally, I really, really like Docker because it makes it easy. On my laptop, uh, I actually just tried out the new uh, preview of uh, Docker from Mac, which works pretty nicely. Uh, so it's really easy to come up with a container, to put my application into a container on my laptop and run it, and even maybe move this one container over to, um, to my production environment. But I really run into trouble as soon as I need to assemble several containers. If I need several containers to interact with, with these, each other and basically have that running in a production environment. That's like a totally different problem compared to like having this one single Docker image I'm moving over from my laptop to the production environment. And this is actually also one of the uh, problems Mesos tried to tackle very early on and we're going to see in a second how it's that's be done. So the origins of Mesos, uh, it's actually, it comes from like two sides. The one side is actually a Berkeley class project of several PhD students. Um, maybe of those, uh, for those of you who also know Spark, those are like also the same people as the Spark founders uh, or the main Spark contributors. And they actually started off with the Nexus project, which was like coming up with a new cluster scheduler for exactly this sharing problem between different uh, like Hadoop, uh, Spark frameworks. And actually, as a result of those, they, one of them gave a tech talk at Twitter. How many of you still remember this Twitter fail whale in the beginning, uh, where they had really problems uh, of scaling their applications? So in the early years, they really had problems with their infrastructure. First of all, to roll out new versions. It took them like uh, two to three weeks to move a version from development to production. And also uh, the same problem with failures. As soon as one part of the cluster failed, this had really had tripling effects uh, throughout the entire infrastructure, which resulted often in this fail whale basically saying that Twitter wasn't available. And when hearing about it, they were really interested and they started really to invest a lot. And this actually led shortly after that um, to the open source project, uh, Apache Mesos. And in December 2010, it was actually submitted to Apache, to the Apache Foundation as an incubator project and has graduated pretty quickly after that. Uh, as like the next evolution step, uh, we as a company with Mesosphere, we actually released a lot of stuff around Mesos. So Mesos itself, it's, uh, we view it as the kernel of the uh, data center operating system. Like the kernel analogy is basically like, what does a kernel do? A kernel offers you some uh, system interfaces um, and a nice API. And we're gonna see how uh, Apache Mesos is doing that for like the surrounding data center operating system. And this data center operating system, it's all also all open source. And it's basically, it's like a UI on top. It's monitoring practices. It's like an app store. But yeah, we're gonna see that in more detail on uh, throughout the talk. Um, from like the vision the early people had, there were like, again, two parts. There was first like the technology part. How can I share resources between, between different frameworks? But in my personal opinion, even more important, there was this vision that we actually uh, want to move away from this notion of individual nodes and actually have this operating system for your data center, which, as mentioned, DCS is trying to be. And um, I really like this analogy, like if you have your local laptop, you personally, you don't care on which processor, on which core your application is running. Most people don't even know that. Sometimes you might actually pin an application to a core, but most of the time you don't care. And um, this is actually the vision to have something similar for your data center. You don't care where it's running, it's just supposed to run. And um, that was the vision those guys had. 
And yeah, Apache Mesos, uh, as mentioned, it's a top-level Apache project, and we actually we call it a cluster resource negotiator. Um, and this actually reflects like the two-level scheduling architecture, um, which means that we can have uh, individual schedulers on top. Uh, it's highly scalable, so for example, Twitter or Apple, uh, they're using it on clusters with several 10,000 nodes. So actually all of you uh, who own an iPhone and have used uh, Apple Siri, you also have used Mesos before. Uh, because actually the Siri infrastructure is powered by Mesos. So even though you might not know about it, you might have used it before. Um, and yeah, running in those environments is actually quite fault tolerant and battle tested. So uh, that's the nice part about Mesos that, which also makes it hard on the other side being an open source contributor there because the uh, community is very protective because any change you might introduce could break the Twitter infrastructure, for example. Um, the second part, which relates back to like the systems API I was mentioning before, is that it's actually also an SDK for writing distributed applications. And uh, in order to tackle like the Docker parts, the container orchestration part, it's actually it also has inbuilt Docker support. That means there is a Docker containerizer which can run Docker containers natively, even uh, recently without the Docker binary, so you don't need a Docker daemon anymore to run your Docker images. And you can also run not just the Docker uh, containers, but also Rocket or in general the AppC containers. The architecture. Um, so in order to achieve this, this abstraction away from the individual nodes here, um, which we call agents or slaves. So those are like individual nodes in your data center. And uh, on top, on the very top, we have like the frameworks or framework schedulers. So in the Mesos terms, a framework scheduler is actually the distributed application. So I have here in the slide, I have two applications. Uh, so one is Marathon. Marathon is basically like a general framework for container orchestration or also long running services. So we actually we view it if we want to stick to this data center uh, analogy uh, or to the operating system analogy, we view it as the init system. You basically, you tell Marathon, I want five instances running of my, uh, web, app, my web containers, uh, my engines or whatever container, and Marathon is going to take care that whatever happens in the cluster, there can be node failures, network partitioning, that there are always five instances of uh, your container running. Myriad is another application. Myriad is actually for those who still want to use the Yarn or Hadoop world. So basically, Myriad is running Yarn on top of Mesos. And yeah, so in this uh, example cluster, we have like two applications running here. And Mesos is basically like the layer in between. So Mesos separates those applications from the underlying uh, agents, and they actually they only talk to Mesos and not to like the nodes directly. And um, this is actually what we refer to as two-level scheduling. And this two-level scheduling, it means I as a user, I only talk to the framework scheduler. So I only talk to like Marathon, uh, I only talk to Myriad, uh, I rarely talk to Mesos itself. And those schedulers, they actually, they get resource offers from Mesos. And in turn, using those resource offers, they can uh, actually launch tasks. And that divides like this scheduling problem into two parts. The one part is like the resource allocation part. Which of the frameworks is uh, eligible to use what kind of resources in my cluster? And the second part is basically I as a scheduler, I can decide what do I want to use those resources for? Do I actually need them? Um, and this division makes it actually quite simple to run different stuff on top of Mesos um, because every scheduler needs has very different decisions. Some might care about data locality, others running stateless applications, they only care about uh, what kind of offers they are having, others actually need a big chunk of resources. So the individual application scheduler decisions, they are quite different uh, from other schedulers. So this is like the idea to give those schedulers an easy interface to implement their specific part and actually every 
uh, everything else uh, underneath can push, be pushed to Mesos. So how, how does it look in a more concrete example? Like one of those agents, it's actually it's going to tell the Mesos master, hey, I got uh, two CPUs free here, and I got 10 gigs of RAM. And it's going to tell that to the master. And then comes basically the uh, allocation part in the master. So the master is going to decide which framework's turn it is to receive those uh, resources. And in this case, it's actually it's a marathon scheduler. So the Mesos master is going to talk to the marathon scheduler to the marathon application and tell it, hey, I got here two CPUs, 10 gigs of RAM. Do you want to use it? And then I the marathon scheduler can actually decide, yes, I need those resources right now, or it can also say, no, right now I'm actually quite happy. I don't need any more resources. And when it decides to use those resources, it's going to tell the Mesos master, I want to start this specific task on it. So there's a generic task description um, where you can tell it to run a Docker container uh, or any container you would like to run or also just like normal uh, commands. This will be communicated back by the master to the agent. And uh, the agent is then actually responsible for starting up this task. Throughout the lifetime of a task, a task can actually send updates. So it can be updates like, uh, I'm finished. Uh, it can be updates like the task has failed because there was a programming error. It could be the task was killed because it was out of memory. Uh, it used too many resources. Um, and this is basically communicated back to the master. And the master will also send those status updates to the scheduler. Uh, the master also detects if one of those nodes fail. So it can also tell the scheduler, hey, those tasks failed because the node uh, is not reachable anymore. Um, as mentioned earlier, this two-level architecture, it actually enables some nice features. And uh, like one example I really like is running like Myriad on top. So Yarn, for those who might not be too familiar with Yarn, Yarn is basically um, also like this uh, cluster manager framework, which tries to distribute resources to different tasks running in mostly like the Hadoop universe. And with Apache Myriad, you can actually run uh, this on top of Mesos. So Mesos is going to give resource offers to Apache Myriad. And the Myriad in itself can use what task should be run on those resources. And that, for example, enables um, companies or users, if you want to have several YARN clusters on one common infrastructure, and you actually might want to scale up and scale down certain certain parts of your YARN cluster. You might want to scale up YARN cluster one because your development team just needs a bigger cluster right now. Uh, and the other one doesn't need as many resources. So it's actually really easy to shift resources between different YARN clusters if it's running on top of Mesos. Um, one really interesting part uh, which uh, really enables a lot of stuff is like the uh, container networking. Um, by default, um, like this is like the out of the box scenario, um, Mesos is just going to schedule containers on different nodes. So uh, I actually I have now six containers running on my instance. Cool, but uh, how can they actually do networking communication between each other? By default, because it was sufficient for the Twitter cluster, actually Mesos just used a single IP per agent, and then they used different ports. So each of those containers would get a different port. But uh, that actually leads to a number of problems. So first of all, a port conflicts. What happens if I have several web services which all want to use port 80? Then those cannot be scheduled to a single agent. Uh, second problem is security. What happens if I have uh, production services and test services running on the same agent or in the same cluster? I don't want that my production web frontend is talking to my test uh, database backend. And of course, also performance. If all containers have a really high egress network bandwidth uh, usage, I soon going to run out of bandwidth. And this is actually uh, an interesting topic. And this is what the next talk is going to be about. How can containers find each other? So if I have my 
a web front end container running on agent one and it actually wants to talk to the um, database container which is running on a different agent how does it find it uh, where it's running. As mentioned before, I as a developer, I don't really want to be aware that there is different nodes underneath, but still the application needs to be able to uh, find out where is that node running and how can it communicate with the different uh, yeah, database service, for example. And so what we introduced for that is basically like each container gets its own IP and then we can have some nice uh, network isolation properties, uh, which there are several projects doing that, but this one is, for example, the Calico project, which is using like IP tables and kernel routing for uh, achieving network isolation. And that enables me to do something uh, similar to this. Can you actually see that, or is the contrast too small? Um, so here we have like A, B, C, and D, they are different tasks or different containers running. And in the first scenario, out of the box, they can all talk to each other. As soon as they figure out where they are running, there's nothing stopping them from talking to each other. But using this uh, network, isolation, uh, network isolator module, you can actually specify only containers A and B can talk to each other, and only containers uh, D and C can talk to each other, but there's no traffic like in between, like uh, A and C, they cannot even send any network packages to each other. And this enables me to, for example, really nicely separate my uh, test and development uh, setup, even though it's running on the same cluster. Um, the next part, this is uh, what I referred to before, is like the systems API uh, Mesos is offering. And if I'm writing uh, distributed applications, so I had to do that quite a lot throughout my PhD, and it's basically, it's always the same. You s have to figure out, uh, is the node available or has the node failed? Where can I start my application? And uh, I also need like a bunch of code to figure out uh, whether a node has failed or a node is not reachable due to a network partitioning. And uh, this is kind of the idea to allow programmers to focus on application logic and not this overhead part like networking related code or fault tolerance code. And uh, actually Spark uh, was an early example just to show, uh, as mentioned before, it's the same people who started out the Mesos project, which started out the Spark project. And initially Spark was actually just a showcase to show how easy it is to write distributed applications using Mesos. Um, so if you want to start your first framework, you mainly have to care about two parts. There's the scheduler part, which was like the application running on top of the Mesos master. And uh, it has basically two responsibilities. The first one is it has to utilize resources. So it's getting a resource offer from the Mesos master, and it has to decide what do I want to do with that. What task do I want to start? Do I want to use the, these resources after all? And the second responsibility is uh, to react on task status updates. So if I, as a framework scheduler, I get told, hey, this, uh, this task has failed, I have to decide, do I want to restart it? Uh, where do I, which offer do I want to use to restart it? So how do I want to react on this? But I don't have to figure out myself that the task has failed. This is all pushed down into Mesos. And the second part, this was what we saw underneath. This is basically the code running on the uh, individual instances. This is what we call it the executor interface. And that's actually optional as Mesos already comes with a command and uh, container executors. So as long as I want to run either uh, anything in containers or I simply want to run like a normal Linux command, uh, I can just use those pre build uh, executors and I don't have to do anything. If I want to do more, uh, actually the responsibility of such an executor is like task lifecycle management. So uh, starting the task, making sure to clean up resources afterwards, and also monitoring to basically figure out that a task has failed, potentially restart it, and if I can't restart it, basically sends a message to the Mesos master telling that the task has failed. So if 
any of you want to try it out. There's actually like a really nice example framework. It has different language implementations in Java, Python, C++, Go, whatever you want to use. Uh, and this is actually what we use uh, for anyone onboarding at Mesosphere. It's like in the first days, they get to write or extend this framework and just play with that. So uh, I can just recommend it if you want to get a feeling for what it takes to write your own framework. Have a look at this Rentler framework. Uh, it has, it's, uh, it actually has two schedulers. It has two executors. So feel free to try that out. And yeah, that brings me to the next part, uh, DCOS. So um, in our world, Mesos is basically like the, the kernel underneath here of the operating system, but you need actually a lot more. You need uh, container orchestration on top, so basically like this management of uh, Docker containers or rocket containers uh, on top. You need security. Uh, like LDAP out authentication, user authentication, and really important with any uh, distributed system, you need uh, monitoring on top to figure out whether your system is still running or whether anything has failed. And uh, this is actually what DCOS is trying to achieve. Basically, provides this, this layers on top of Mesos. You still need to have a decent operating system. Uh, also, DCOS, it's uh, all open source, uh, so you can use it on any cloud system like AWS. There are pre built installers for that, Azure. Uh, you can also run it on your uh, bare metal hardware. There are installers for that. And uh, it's actually, it has a quite uh, big community already, even though it's still very young. So there are a lot of uh, companies uh, contributing. I think there were like 60 launch partners, including like Verizon, uh, HP, uh, Microsoft, which all really contribute to this ecosystem. And I can talk a lot, but what I would really like to do is just show you uh, the interface. So actually, I started up a DCOS cluster before. So this is right now running on Amazon. And this is like the first dashboard people are going to see if they log into DCOS. And uh, what I find important here is that actually the focus, like if I scroll down here, I see how many nodes are connected. But this is not the focus. Because if I'm operating a large cluster, I don't want to be paged at night just because a single node failed. I don't care so much about the nodes. What I more care about is that my services like Cassandra or Marathon, that they are healthy and running in my cluster. So uh, and the second part I might care about is like cluster utilization. So 25%, uh, so this is right now pretty low. But I also want to be aware if as soon as I hit like 90%, then it might be time to actually add more nodes or then something is wrong in my cluster and soon nodes might start to fail. Um, like on the service tab, I actually I pre-installed uh, Cassandra here, because that usually takes a while uh, to set up uh, in the background. But the installation, it's actually it's quite simple. So we have something, it's called the universe. And the universe, it's basically, it's like the app store for your cluster. So uh, we have a number of uh, certified packages in there. So it's really easy. It's like a one-click install. I just clicked here, and this enabled me to install uh, Cassandra in my cluster. I can do the same for Sparklight right now. It's going to ask me whether I want to use a default install or whether I want like a more uh, elaborate, whether I want to set more settings. Uh, but right now, I'm happy with the default install. And so this is right now starting to install in my cluster. Let's have a look how that looks. As mentioned, Marathon is like the init system of our cluster. So we also use Marathon to start all those applications. And the network isn't very fast, but yeah. So uh, here we actually we see the different applications running in my cluster. Uh, Cassandra is running. Uh, Marathon LB, this is actually a load balancer, which we're going to use in a second. Uh, and Spark is right now deploying. Usually, like the first deploy, it takes a while because uh, this is actually needs to pull a Docker image. Uh, 
Uh, and for the a default AWS clusters, we're actually using Docker Hub, so it's an external pull. Uh, what I would recommend for production clusters is to run your own uh, Docker registry inside your cluster. So this will be much, much faster. Um, just to show you how easy it is to just start an application, you can actually also do that via the uh, UI. So I like sleep task, which is basically just like sleep. And I'm going to use a pretty small number. Uh, 0.1 CPUs is enough. And one instance. And um, so this is like uh, now launch deploying the sleep task in my cluster. Uh, and we see it's already running. And the point I wanted to show with that is that actually, as it's just sleeping for 20 seconds, so after 20 seconds, the task it's going to finish. Um, but as Marathon is task of always running like one instance of this task, it's actually it's going to restart it all the time. And we should see that in the updated column back there. I like fast networks. Yeah, so we see it's, it, it has been updated. And that just means it started like a new instance because the first one was gone. What we can also do, we can easily scale it up and scale down. So I right now just started one instance. We can simply tell it to start two. And I see one unscheduled, but that should also start in a second. Yeah, now we have one of two running. <laughs> it, it should come up in a second. Um, yeah, here it is. Perfect. <laughs> um, like sleep applications, that's quite easy and cool, but uh, we want to do something real, right? Uh, so as Mesos has the origins at Twitter, I actually want to show you how we easily we can spin up like our own Twitter clone. So we actually we have an application. It's called Twitter. And uh, what I have prepared is like a small JSON file, which is like the app definition. And those app definitions. I would also recommend you, like, if you're running something in production, any applications, uh, you should really have those JSON files uh, describing your application, and you also should version those files. So we see that still, like, a lot of production customers, they're still calling us, like, my application is failing for this and this reason. And uh, it's sometimes really hard to track what applications they are running because they are not really versioning uh, the App, the configuration or the description, what they're starting. Um, so this is actually, this looks much longer than it actually <laughs> is, but it's actually uh, just specifying that we want to run the uh, Mesosphere Twitter Docker container with certain uh, co uh, port mapping configurations in order to specify the network. And uh, it also, it gives it some uh, environment variables specifying where to find like the Kafka broker or the uh, Cassandra broker. And um, what I personally find important there is that you don't specify like a, an IP where you can find, for example, the Kafka broker. You specify like the ser uh, uh, like a, a service URL, like uh, it's can be found under services broker zero TCP Kafka dot Mesos. So it also if it changes, so if that node fails where that Kafka broker zero is running, it'll still find it because it's just using this host name. All right. And now what I can simply do also via the command line, I can do anything I can do via the command line. I could also do via the UI. But as soon as I want to script stuff and really use it in a production setting, I would always use like a CLI or sending what you can also do. You can send those JSON files to the Marathon REST points, for example, directly. But the UI is still nice to show. So I'm deploying a new Marathon app. So I do Marathon app at Twitter application.json. 
So this is now sending it to the uh, to the endpoint, and let's see. By the way, here we installed Spark, and we see that now Spark is running healthy in our cluster. Network, network, network. Yeah, there it's coming up. So uh, here, yeah, we see that uh, one of our Twitter instances is running, one of our Twitter containers. And now let's see whether we can actually reach that. Yay, it worked. So let's actually tweet something. I I I I like demos. I like demos. <laughs> Let's just see what went wrong. I suppose it didn't find the. It actually worked. I I what I suppose what just happened is that one of the tasks failed, and in the background he didn't switch quickly enough. So yeah, <laughs> it's still there, and it's actually it's stored in the Cassandra database, and this is why now when it. Basically, the load balancer referred to like the new instance coming up. We can still see it, <laughs> safe. Um, so, um, and what we usually want to show with this demo is that it's really easy in this new microservice world to plug up different services. You can bring up like the Cassandra uh, database. You can update your Cassandra database. You can actually, if you want, you could run several Cassandra instances in your cluster with different versions with different configurations for different teams because you can easily share the cluster underneath. All right. Uh, now, being Twitter, or having actually the problem Twitter was having in the beginning, uh, we soon run out of uh, instances. Uh, like, we have a lot of traffic. A lot of users want to use this cool new Twitter app. And uh, so we actually we have to scale it up. And uh, what um, you can would do in a normal scenario, you actually you have an autoscaler which looks out for certain metrics. Uh, what makes this autoscaling part kind of difficult is that each application has different criteria when they want to scale up. For example, for if you have a Hadoop job running and it's using 100% CPU time, that's actually that's okay because it just tries to greedily use all the resources. But if I have something user facing, like this Twitter application, this Twitter user interface, and that's using uh, like more than 90% CPU, then I might be into trouble. So, for example, for the Twitter app, what uh, our autoscaler in the production systems it's using, it's watching the latency. If the latency goes up, we would start new containers. And so, I can do that here. As we've seen before, I can simply say scale to three applications. And uh, we're actually going to end up with more. Yeah, here now it's also going faster. So we're going to end up with more instances of uh, our Twitter container, and we can serve more uh, users in the interface. All right, that brings me back to my presentation and actually almost to the end. We've seen this. We've seen the App Store. Uh, so the App Store, I personally really like it a lot because it just makes it so easy. And it actually makes it also easy for people who are developing like a new product. For example, we have uh, a RangoDB, which is uh, also a multimodal database. I saw that OrientDB is going to have a talk here tomorrow. And they actually developed it uh, against Mesos because first of all it made, it made it very easy for them to write like this distribution layer and secondly also for them it's really nice if they need like a demo cluster they s just spin up a DCOS cluster and can simply install a RangoDB there without worrying about the underlying infrastructure uh, without having to set up like their servers underneath. Yeah, this is DCOS if you want to try it out. It's DCOS IO. Uh, and you can easily spin up uh, your own cluster on Azure, Amazon, or download the installers for your own hardware. And as mentioned, it's all open source. So yeah, just try it out. Thank you very much for listening. And...